This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need a pair of bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. GiveTorch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. I think there are two kinds of Torah students. There is one kind of Torah student that when Parshas Truma rolls around and we start talking about the tabernacle, the precursor for the temple, and the vessels, and the garments of the high priest, and then we have a whole book of Leviticus, the book of sacrifices, there's one kind of student that goes into hibernation, wake me up when Leviticus ends. Wake me up for numbers. There's one kind of student that dreads all the talk about the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and everything associated with it. It feels like reading legalese, boring architectural prose. That's one kind of student. There's a second kind of student that relishes the challenge of trying to plumb the depths and the meanings behind the tabernacle, its vessels, the practices. This second student is intrigued and curious about all the vessels, 
and all the mystery and all the dimensions. The second student knows that everything we read in the parsha and the ensuing parshios, it's all replete with meaning, with insight, with endless, infinite wisdom. And we feel privileged and honored to try to decipher its mysteries year after year. In the Parsha podcast, we strive to be like the second student. And I could tell you, when I first read the Parsha this week again, I got this amazing feeling of like meeting an old friend and sitting down to chat. What an amazing opportunity. So let's begin. The Parsha starts off with a fundraising drive. You know how much that excites me. Moshe is instructed to seek donors for 15 different raw materials, gold, silver, copper, three different kinds of wool, linen, goat hair, reddened goatskin, hide from a mysterious unicorn-like animal called a tachash, wood, various oils and spices, and various precious stones. And then he's told to build a tabernacle, to build a mishkan, to build a sanctuary for God to dwell in. And specifically, he's told to build all the vessels, build the ark, and the ark is comprised of three nested parts. You have the gold box. In the gold box, you put the bottomless wooden box, and you cover it, and you render it invisible by a second gold box in which the tablets and the shards of the broken tablets were placed. And then we read how the ark is wreathed by a golden crown, sealed by a gold-hewn cherub canopied covered, and fastened by two gold-plated wooden poles for transport. And then we read about the table, the shulchan. It's also made of gold, and it's also adorned with a golden crown, and it's affixed with poles. And at the top of the shulchan, on top of the table, you have dishes in which the showbreads were baked and stored each week. And then we read about the menorah which is like a candelabra hewn from a single block of gold consisting of seven intricately embellished branches. And then we read about the Mishkan's three or perhaps four exquisitely embroidered covers and all the loops and all the hooks. And then we read about the vertical wooden walls and how the bottoms are placed in silver sockets, and the tops in gold rings, and how they're reinforced with horizontal supporting bars. And then we read about the mysterious and miraculous 70-cubit-long middle bar, the Brea Chatichon, that snaked through the beams, miraculously turning 90 degrees twice. And finally, we read about the copper-covered outer altar, and the dimensions and the makeup of the Mishkan's courtyard. It's a lovely Parsha. It's bursting with mystery and intrigue. And I looked back at last year's Parsha podcast, and we spoke about the Ark. And I looked back at two years ago's Parsha podcast, and we also spoke about the Ark. This year, let us explore and ponder the menorah. We're going to begin with sharing some observations about the menorah. We're going to ask some questions about its construction. In our answer, we're trying to identify the essence of the menorah. And then we're going to suggest a new approach to understanding how we can adopt the insight of the menorah into our lives. Our parsha dedicates 10 verses describing what the menorah looked like and how it was to be constructed. Interestingly, the construction requirements of the menorah are actually repeated in the book of Numbers, chapter 8, verse 4. Now, when we look at the construction of the menorah, we find that it has some unusual characteristics. It's made out of solid, pure gold. It has to be hammered out of a single block of gold It cannot be welded together. It has a base with three legs. Out of the base comes a single vertical shaft. And out of this middle shaft, you have six branches, three on either side for a total of seven branches. You have the middle shaft plus the six that emerged from either side. And the menorah is embellished with decorative cups and knobs and flowers 
and they're engraved like almonds. And if you read the verses, it's a bit confusing. It's helpful to see a diagram. But the Rambam actually does a tally for us. There were a grand total of 22 different intricately engraved cups in the menorah. And there were 11 knobs and nine flowers, all engraved like almonds. Now, you may recall in Parshas Korach, when Aaron's priesthood was challenged, his staff sprouted almonds, and of course it makes a connection for us, maybe the almond-like engravings in the menorah somehow relate to the almonds that sprouted on Aaron's staff in Parshas Korach, especially given that the menorah, of course, was lit by Aaron and his descendants. So this is the menorah. It's a very intricate and finely detailed embellishments all hammered out out of a single block of gold. And then on top of these seven branches are seven lamps, each one that holds olive oil and the wick, and all those are lit each night. And we're told also that the direction of the light all goes towards the middle, the ones on the right and the ones on the left all are shaped or or directed to go towards the middle. Of course, this is really interesting. And our challenge is to try to find the meaning. What's the meaning? What's the insight behind it? And when we examine all the commentaries, we find all kinds of symbolisms and insights. So we're told, for example, that the seven branches of the menorah correspond to the seven days of the week. And the middle shaft, well, that's the Shabbos. And all the other branches are directed towards the middle. And that's representing the spiritual day of the week and everything else kind of associates with it. And we have to think about Shabbos the whole week. One idea of the menorah, really interesting. I saw a very interesting Rabbein Bahaya in verse 31. He says some unbelievably beautiful things about the menorah. So first of all, he tells us that the menorah, we're going to light it, of course, every night. And that light actually gives pleasure to our soul. Why? Because the verse states in Proverbs chapter 20, Ner Hashem Nishmas Adam. The soul of man is like a candle, is like a light. And even though he tells us the soul, the neshama, has a spiritual light, and on the menorah there is a physical light, nevertheless, the soul has pleasure whenever there is a menorah lit, whenever there is candles lit, the candle of the soul is happy, is gladdened when there is the candle of the menorah. And then he tells us that there are seven candles, and that corresponds to the seven planets. But wait a minute, aren't there eight planets? He's talking about the seven planets aside from Earth. And by the way, The sages apparently were not fooled by the Pluto head fake. They already considered Pluto to not be a planet. So besides for Earth, there are seven. And then he tells us that the menorah symbolizes Torah. Again, quotes a verse in Proverbs chapter 6. Kiner mitzvah v'torah or a mitzvah is like a candle and Torah is like light. And when you light the menorah, it's symbolic of Torah. And then he says that the menorah, like we said, it symbolizes Torah, but there are seven branches. And he explains that there is a concept, this is of course an ancient Greek idea, that there are seven different branches of wisdom. This is what we call the seven liberal arts, astronomy, Mathematics, geometry, music, rhetoric, grammar, and dialectic. That was the Greek system of wisdom. And the Torah, the Torah is like the Alpha Wisdom. The Torah incorporates all of the wisdoms in the world. If you have just Torah, because it is the mothership, it is the origin of the world and its mysteries and wisdom, if you have Torah and you understand it in all its depth and beauty, 
you will actually be able to deduce from Torah all of these seven wisdoms. And then he tells us that the six branches that go out from either side of the shaft, they represent the six ends of the world. Because the six ends of the world, they all hinge upon the Torah that was given on the sixth day of Sivan at the Sinai Revelation. Like the verse says in Jeremiah chapter 33, Imlo brisi yomom valayla chukrash mavaras losamti. If not for the Torah, the world would cease to exist. The world relies upon the Torah. The world hinges upon the Torah. The whole world is suspended. Will it endure or will it self-combust? And that is determined by Torah study. We believe that if for a second there was a total dearth of Torah being studied in the world, the world would instantly cease to exist. Torah study forms a connection, a bond, a pipeline connecting the spiritual world and the physical world. And so long as our world is connected to its source, it has vitality and continuity. But if you unplug this world from the spiritual world, it's like pulling out the plug of a lamp. The lamp goes out instantly, pulling the plug on the world, stopping Torah study for a second, the world ceases. That's also hinted to in the menorah. And then we read how each branch has six decorative cups, plus one cup at the base of the shaft, So that gives us a grand total of 22 cups that were engraved in the menorah. Well, 22 represents, we're told, in the Rebbeinu B'chai, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. These are the 22 letters that make up Torah, and all that's hinted to in the cups of the menorah. And then he tells us that there are 22 different forces in the world. This sounds maybe a little bit more... Kabbalistic or theological, but there are 22 different forces that control the world. And then he tells us that there are 22 different parts of man. And then he says that the knobs correspond to angels and the cups correspond to the galaxies, the higher spheres, and the flowers correspond to this world, and they all connect in the menorah. Really interesting symbolism. And this idea is found in all the commentaries where they try to illuminate, no pun intended, for us, the meaning and the insight behind the menorah. The Balatum tells us that there are seven branches corresponding to the seven firmaments. What that means? I don't know, but it's a basic idiom, a basic concept of Kabbalah, that there are seven firmaments And there's only a distance of 500 years between each firmament. What that means, I don't know. But again, it's representing very high and advanced ideas in the seven branches of the menorah. And then he tells us that if you look at the entire section describing the menorah, you will not find the letter Samach, one of the 22 letters of the alphabet. Why? Because the Samach represents the Satan. The bad angel. Of course, the angel who is executing the will of God. We don't believe that there is a Satan, some sort of force that's independent of God. Nevertheless, this is a punishing angel. And that letter represents that angel. And you won't find that letter in the entirety of the section of the menorah. Why? Because the menorah thwarts and stymies the Satan. This week I had the privilege and honor to peruse a magisterial work written by Rabbi Moshe Isserlis, the rabbi of Krakow, but also the co-author of the Shulchan Aruch, which is the Code of Jewish Law. He wrote a book on the tabernacle and the temple and all the vessels and all the sacrifices and all the deeper meanings and symbolism. This book is called Torah Sa'ola the Torah of the elevation sacrifice. And he explains the meaning behind every vessel and every sacrifice and every daily sacrifice and every occasional sacrifice. And you look at this book and he starts off the book and he says, 
well, today we don't have a temple. But when you study the laws of the temple and the laws of the tabernacle and the laws of the sacrifices, you get the merit of those sacrifices. And therefore, we're going to write this amazing book that covers it all. And this book is really thick, 400 pages, but tiny, tiny letters. There is so much there. And again, here at the Parsha Podcast, we are humble enough to say that these are advanced ideas and we're trying to get into it. We're trying to explore it a little bit, but we are aware that there is so much unfathomable depth to every idea, to every nuance, to every jot and tittle in the Torah. So that's by way of introduction. But here is the angle of the menorah that I want to discuss today. Today! Rosh Chodesh Adar, the day of unbridled joy. Although our Parsha dedicates 10 verses to describe, apparently comprehensively, how the menorah is made, Moshe did not understand it. Rashi actually says this twice. The first verse begins, Vasisa Menorah Zavtar, make a menorah of pure gold, Miksha Te'ase. It should be hammered out, Te'ase. The word Te'ase does not mean you should make it, rather it means it shall be made. So Rashi says, Rashi of course picks up on that, a little nuance, Ta'ase versus Te'ase. Ta'ase means you should make it Te'ase, it will be made, apparently on its own, says Rashi, Me'eleha, it will be made on its own. What does that mean? Moshe had a hard time with it. He didn't understand it. Amr Lakash Bakh was a God said to Moshe, throw the hunk of gold into the fire, and the menorah will be made on its own. And that's why, says Rashi, the verse does not say, Ta'ase, you should make it. Rather, it says, Te'ase, it shall be made on its own. God's going to make it. You're not going to make it. It's too advanced. It's too complicated for Moshe. Moshe didn't understand it. And therefore, it will be made on its own. In verse 40, we have a similar idea Rashi tells us. The verse says, the God tells Moshe, Ure Eva, I say, you should see it and you should make it. And you should see it the way I show it to you on the mountain. Says Rashi, look now on the mountain. I'm going to show you the shape of the menorah. This teaches us, again, Rashi tells us, this teaches us that Moshe did not understand how to make the menorah. He wasn't able to visualize it. Until the Almighty showed him a menorah of fire superimposed on the mountain. And once he was able to visualize it on the mountain, he was able to understand it. So Rashi tells us in two different ways that Moshe struggled with the menorah. There's a joke I used to make that even today, Jews are not really known for our visuospatial intellect. But jokes aside... This is a really strange thing. You know, Moshe, the greatest man who ever lived. This is Moshe, after all. He understood everything. He understood all the secrets that were beyond all the other humans. He understood the secret of the Paraduma, of the red heifer. But somehow Moshe is struggling with the menorah. Why did Moshe struggle with the menorah? Midrash actually tells us that Moshe was shown the menorah four times. He really had a hard time with the menorah. Why is Moshe struggling so hard with the menorah? Now you may think, well, the menorah, it's kind of hard. It's hard to visualize. It's very intricate. It's a little bit confusing. Maybe the menorah is just objectively hard to grasp. Not so, says the Midrash. Moshe had a hard time with the menorah. He had to be shown the menorah four different times until it clicked for Moshe. But then Moshe went to Betzalel. Betzalel, of course, is going to be hired to oversee the construction. The general contractor of the Mishkan 
is a precocious 13-year-old named Betzalel. And the Midrash tells us that when Moshe told Betzalel about the menorah, he did it right away. He had no confusion whatsoever. And Moshe was, was so surprised by this. He couldn't believe it. He was flummoxed. How is it possible that I had such a hard time with the menorah, but for Betzalel, it was a cinch. The menorah is hard for Moshe, but only Moshe, Betzalel, had no problem with it whatsoever. So why is the menorah only hard for Moshe? There's an additional angle to this question. Moshe is struggling with building the vessels of the tabernacle, but only with the menorah. Why was the menorah the only thing that was beyond Moshe's understanding, but the ark and the table and the altar and all the beams and all the covers? Moshe had no problem with that. You would think, you know, the ark, the ark is housed in the Holy of Holies. It's the most ethereal, the most lofty, and the most impenetrable to ordinary human intellect. For some reason, Moshe is baffled by the menorah and nothing else. He had to have it shown to him in fire, superimposed on the mountain. He wasn't able to make it, and he just threw all the gold into the fire, and it was transformed into a fully made menorah with all the exact specifications. Somehow Moshe is struggling with the menorah and the menorah exclusively, not the ark, not the table, not the altar, not anything else, just the menorah. Now, in previous years, we did ask this question and we pondered the subject in a few different ways. So we talked about this question, I believe, in previous years. We asked the question, you know, why was it shown to him, the fiery image superimposed upon the mountain, if anyhow, he's not going to make it, he's anyhow not going to be able to do it on his own, he's going to have to have it thrown into the fire. So why show it to him, if anyhow, it's not going to help? That was one angle that we took in the past. A second angle that we took in the past, or this was a question, we don't have an answer yet. We pointed out that the process of throwing gold into a fire and something that's completed emerges. Well, that actually happened in a different instance. Rashi tells us later on in in Exodus chapter 32, verse 4, that the way Aaron made the golden calf was by collecting all the gold, throwing it into a fire, and then some of the Egyptian sorcerers came and did some sort of heebie-jeebie, and the golden calf emerged from the fire. So, to me, this is striking, that we have this really strange way to create something that's uncreatable by ordinary human methods, and we have this unusual process that yields such opposite things. We have the menorah, and we have the golden calf. Now, this is another point. Maybe this is the secret to, to get the answer. We know that Aaron, he actually, he made the golden calf. Now, of course, we have ways to try to justify what he did. The Talmud talks about that. But Aaron ultimately made the golden calf, and Aaron is the one that lights the menorah. So maybe that's not a coincidence. Maybe this is, so to speak, Aaron's way of fixing it, and therefore the menorah and the golden calf are somehow connected And that would not shock us because, after all, their ways that they were constructed, well, that was identical. But those were the discussions in previous years. This year, it's 2022. It's February 2nd. It's 2-2-2-2. It's an unusual day. We want to keep it simple. Let's try to keep it simple. Let's ask some basic questions. Why is Moshe... So confused by the menorah, especially when Betzalel was able to do it so easily. And why is the menorah especially so hard? Not the ark, not the table, 
not any other vessels in the tabernacle. Perhaps we can suggest an answer. The Talmud tells us that both the Ark and the Menorah represent Torah. The Talmud tells us the book of Bava Basra, page 25b, Am Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak says, Harotzeshayachim, if someone wants wisdom, Yadrim, they should go to the south. And if someone wants wealth, they should go to the north. And the way to remember this is that the, the shulchan, the table in the tabernacle, which represents wealth, that was on the northern side. And the menorah, which represents Torah, well, that was on the south. And therefore, that's how you remember that the wealth is in the north and the wisdom is in the south. Now, what this means, I have no idea. What does it mean that there's wealth in the north and wisdom, Torah, in the south? But I was thinking maybe this is why torches Base is in Texas, because if you want Torah, you got to go to Texas, to the south. I don't know. But regardless, the Talmud tells us that the menorah represents Torah. We saw this earlier in the Rabbeinu B'chaya. Now, the Ark, well, the Ark also represents Torah. The Talmud even says that a Torah scholar has got to be like the Ark, gold inside and gold outside. So why are there two different vessels representing Torah? What's the difference between the Torah of the Ark and the Torah of the Menorah? So this is a question that's been asked before, and various answers have been suggested. So, for example, some suggest, well, the Ark, that's the written Torah, and the Menorah, that is the oral Torah. But some of the commentaries say something fascinating. They say that both the Ark and the Menorah, they both represent Torah, but there is a critical difference between the Torah of the Aron, of the Ark, and the Torah of the Menorah. The Ark, the Ark contained the Luchos, The tablets, both the tablets that Moshe shattered at the foot of the mountain after he witnessed the revelry of the golden calf and the second set of tablets that endured. These tablets were etched by the finger of God. The ark represents the Torah that Moshe got directly from God. When Moshe received this prophecy, we're told that that is done to him right between the cherubs in the ark in the Holy of Holies. The word of God that has no filters, that comes directly from God and is not embellished, it's not translated, it is not amended, it is not tampered with in any way, the unadulterated word of God is represented in the ark. And our saints tell us that Moshe was different than any other prophets. Moshe, he prophesied with Zehadavar. This is the word of God. Whereas all the other prophets, they only prophesied with Koam Hashem. So says God. Kind of the general message of God, but not the exact words of God. Moshe, his prophecy is the unadulterated, unchanged, unfiltered, precise word of God. In the words of the Talmud, when Moshe spoke his prophecy, Shechina medaberes mitok grono, the Shechina, the divine presence, is as if speaking from his throat. Moshe is but a funnel for the word of God. He contributed, elucidated, added absolutely nothing of his own to the Word of God. The Word of God went through him with no change, no loss of latency, no diminishment or erosion of any sort, the unadulterated Word of God. 
Not so with the other prophets. The other prophets, they're able to convey the general message of God, but they have to absorb it within them, filter it within them, and express it in their own words. Says the Talmud, the book of Sanhedrin, page 89a. Ein shnei nevim mesnavim besignon echad. You don't have two prophets that use the same style. Every prophet has their own style. Each one of them is given a message. Message, of course, comes from God. But they have to filter it through themselves. And they have to rephrase it in their own style. They have to give their own spin, their own kind of individualized, unique take on the message of God. They absorb the message. They process it within them. And what emerges is something that's shaded with their influence. The Torah, the 613 mitzvahs, are included only in the Torah of Moshe. It's only Mosaic. Why? Because the Torah has to be the word of God, the precise word of God, without any non-divine influences. And therefore, all 613 mitzvahs come from the Torah and zero of them, zero of the biblical mitzvahs, that is, come from non-Mosaic prophets. The Ark represents the Torah of Moshe, direct from God, unfiltered, and uninfluenced by anyone, including Moshe. The menorah, that also represents Torah. That also represents the Word of God. But it's not a mosaic version of this. It's like all the other prophets. The menorah represents you taking the light, the light that comes, of course, originally from the ark, but taking that light and capturing that light and spreading that light, extending that light forward. You take the Torah of the ark and you filter it and then you diffuse it onward. For us, the menorah represents taking the Torah and making it Ours, the words of the Talmud, Nasis Torah a delay. It becomes your Torah. You have to adopt the Torah. Make it your own. Give it your own interpretation. Place your signature on the Torah. Now, of course, this should not be represented as changing, God forbid, the Torah. That's not what we're saying over here. We're saying that you have to make the Torah yours. You have to assimilate it into yourself and make it your Torah. We pray the same, give us our portion in Torah. We have to have Torah that's ours. Every individual at Sinai received their own experience. Torah is not supposed to be monochromatic. Of course, there are general guardrails of Torah. There's a system in which your individuality can be expressed, but we're not here to be puppets. The Almighty did not give Torah to robots. He gave it to humans. And the objective is to absorb the Torah within you and to make it yours. Kind of merge the Torah with your own soul and your own individuality and to take that and to spread it forward, to take the light of that Torah mixed with the light of your soul, your Torah, and spread it onward. All this was foreign to Moshe. Moshe did not understand the concept of the menorah. Now, of course, we have a a mature approach to this. We're not going to take an infantile approach to the Torah. Certainly not after so many years of the Parsha podcast. If Moshe is struggling with the menorah, he's not struggling with the physical construction of the menorah. He is struggling with the spiritual ideas and symbolisms inherent in the menorah. And for Moshe, the idea of someone contributing some of their own little flavor and style to the Torah, that is totally anathema to Moshe. That is only for someone who's not in Moshe's universe. Moshe studied Torah directly from God. He knew it all from the source. 
when he spoke the words of Torah, it was the words of God verbatim. The idea of Torah of the menorah, that's only for others. What an interesting idea. The ark, well, that's the Torah of Moshe. The menorah represents a kind of Torah study that only people who are not Moshe can relate to. But Salel, no problem. Us, maybe we need a picture, a diagram, no problem. For Moshe, his Torah is coalesced in the ark, between the cherubs, in the ark itself, with the tablets. That is the Torah of Moshe. This perhaps can also explain the sequencing of these vessels in our Parsha. Parsha starts off with a general introduction, fundraise, and build the tabernacle. But then we're told the specifics, it starts off with the ark and the cover. And then it proceeds to the table, the shulchan, and then it goes on to the menorah. And the sages ask, well, why does the table, the shulchan, go before the menorah? And the common answer is that the table represents wealth and the monarchy. And in Jewish life, there's the concept of the Sachar zevulan partnership. There's the partnership between the titans of industry and the titans of Torah. There were two brothers, one Yisachar who spent his whole life studying, and one brother Zavulon who spent his whole life making a lot of money. He was a businessman. He was a capitalist. He was someone who would travel and do deals. He was a merchant. And they made a deal. Yisachar says, I'm giving you half of my Torah. Zavulon says, I'm giving you half of my money. And this was a beautiful partnership that... Of course, it was represented by the sons of Jacob, but it's an idea that continues even today. When Moshe has to give a blessing, when, when Jacob has to give a blessing, he first mentions Zevulon, the tycoon brother, and then he mentions Yisachar, the Torah scholar brother. Now, we would think that well, the Torah scholar goes, goes first. Not only that, Yisachar was older. So why does Zevulun go first? And the answer is that the people who undertake the sacred mission of financially upholding the Yisachars, the Torah scholars of the world, they are the ones who have more honor. The mission tells us if there's no flower, there's no Torah. Without Zevulun doing his business, there can be no Yisachar in the tense of Torah study, studying Torah. And therefore, when we talk about the table, the table is representative of Zevulon. That's the support of Torah. That is wealth, prosperity, monarchy. That comes first, and then comes the menorah. Then comes the Torah scholars. But here's the question. What about the ark? The Ark also represents Torah, but it comes before the Shulchan, before the table. Now we know the answer. The Ark indeed represents Torah, but a mosaic level of Torah. Moshe, we're told, he was enriched. He became the richest Jew, but no one gave him a penny. Moshe did not need to rely on the largesse of the Zavulans of the world. Moshe was enriched by God himself. Of course, Moshe is on a different level. And the kind of Torah that Moshe is dealing with, maybe some of the sages of the Talmud as well are on that level. But that Torah, the Torah of the Ark, indeed comes before the table. But for ordinary people, no one's ordinary, but for Torah outside of the Mosaic context, that's the menorah. And indeed, that only relies on the table, on the Zavulans, and the Zavulon comes first. What an idea. Moshe is on a level reached by no one else. To him, the Torah of the menorah, it's so foreign. He simply could not understand it. 
for Batsalo and frankly anyone else, that notion is basically the only way we know how to study Torah. We don't have access to the to the art. It's in the Holy of Holies. It's totally beyond us. We never held the tablets. We never experienced prophecy from God, certainly not the prophecy of Moshe. For us, we process the Torah in the menorah fashion. So now we know why Moshe struggled so mightily specifically with the menorah because that represented a much more lower, almost like a diluted version of Torah relative to Moshe. Of course, for us, that's the only Torah that we have. But for Moshe, on his level, with his history, with his level of prophecy, to him, the menorah was, in fact, foreign. But I think this gives us a launching point to a very interesting idea. We process Torah via the system and the symbolism of the menorah. I think we can suggest that if you look at the embellishments of the menorah, perhaps you find an approach of how we are supposed to study Torah. So the menorah had four different types of embellishments. There were cups, the gevim, 22 of them. And there were knobs. And the knobs were told, a knob is rounded and represents the idea of revelation, the idea of seeing the full picture, the full perspective. You have this idea of the cups, which almost represent like a vessel. And then we have the knobs, which represent the kind of the global view, the rounded, complete, comprehensive perspective. And then we have the flowers, which represent the sprouting. And then we have the embellishment engraved like almonds. And the word for that is mishukadim. Shtedim is almonds. But interestingly, the Hebrew word shokdim or shtida, which is the same word as almonds, also means diligence. Perhaps we can say, now that we know that the Torah that we are striving for is the Torah of the menorah. Maybe for Moshe, it's, it's incomprehensible. For us, the Ark is incomprehensible. Perhaps we can say that the various embellishments of the menorah are describing for us a comprehensive process of self-development through Torah. Let's look at it. It starts off with the cups. It goes to the knobs. And then it proceeds to the flowers, and finally, it ends off with the almonds, which, again, translates as diligence. You start off as a cup. Maybe you're an empty cup, but you're a vessel. Once you're a vessel, you can fill up that vessel. The way we start our journey of self-transformation, of turning into the menorah, of illuminating the world... Before we do that, we have to have a menorah. What does that look like? You have to start with a cup. You have to be willing to listen. Willing to have your cup filled. And you absorb the Torah of your teachers. You absorb that Torah that, of course, originally came from the Ark. Originally came from Moshe. And the first thing you have to do once you have a cup is to try to fill it up. Fill up your cup. Once your cup is full, brimming to the top with the Torah taught to you by your teachers. It's time to move on to the knobs and the flowers. What is the rounded knobs? So we said earlier, I say to tell us that the, the knobs represent like a global view, a big perspective. Once you have Torah, you have to study it. You have to ruminate upon it. You have to examine it from all the angles, try to see it from all the perspectives. And finally, you have to plant the sapling, plant the flower. The objective of the Torah is to not just have it like in an abstract way, but to have it absorbed in your bones and have it filter through you and allow it to germinate within you and eventually sprout forth. You want to plant a seed, there's a lot of waiting. You start off, 
and you made sure the right inputs are there, but it takes a long time before that can actually surface and be shown to the world. You want to teach Torah, make sure that your cup is full, make sure that you have that process of, of the knobs, and then you plant the seed. You're trying to make your mark on Torah. You're trying to make the Torah yours. That's the goal, to spread that light, that illumination of the Torah in every direction. You have to express the Torah in your own style. Like the flower, it takes some time. You have to do the precise inputs. When it starts off, maybe you have a little bud, but eventually it will mature into beautiful flowers of Torah. Of course, it all comes from Osha. It all comes from the Ark. But it's going to be stamped with your mark, with your flower, with your cups and knobs and flowers. The light of the menorah is there to connect and to merge with the light of your soul. The soul and its light, the Torah and its light, manifested in the world with the menorah. The Talmud tells us that the greatest sages, when they wanted to give a compliment to a student who said a new and novel insight in Torah, they would say, Kaftor vaferach, knob and flower. The, the words of the embellishments of the menorah. Kaftor vaferach. When you start off, it's the teachers. The teachers are filling up your cup. When you take that tar and make it yours, it's a process of kaftor vaferach, knobs and flowers. The knobs and flowers are the process of taking what you filled your cup with and making it yours. But again, there is a fourth criterion. There's one more requirement, and that is it's got to be like the almonds. It's got to be done with diligence, with shikida. You want to have your own menorah. You want to spread Torah on your own. It's got to be like those almonds. But if you do that, you too can make your mark. Again, as we started off the tabernacle, it's vessels. It may seem quite boring to the novice, but upon examination, we find that they are bursting, packed to the gills with insight and with meaning, may we all indeed become worthy of having a menorah of Torah develop within us. Okay, let's get to this week's exquisite insight. Are you ready? Let's go. The parish begins with a fundraising drive. Daber el b'nei Yisrael, speak to the children of Israel. V'yichu li truma, and they will give to me donations. Everyone's inspired. Everyone who has broadness of heart, let them give the gold, the silver, etc. Now, if you look at the precise words, you'll find a problem, a problem here. God is telling Moshe to ask for donations. So, when you ask someone to, to give a donation, you would say, to give a donation, right? So, you would say, the Hebrew word for giving is liten or natan. So if the Torah says that Moshe wants the nation to give donations, it would say v'yitnuli truma. They will give to me a donation. But it says the opposite. V'yikhuli truma. They will take for me a donation. Is a donation giving or taking? We always thought it's, it's to give a donation. Give a donation. Here we're told it's to take a donation. Why does the Torah use this unusual word? So the Beis Alevi, amongst many others, they say there's something very special about giving a donation for the tabernacle, but in general, giving charity. You may think that you're giving, but the truth is that at least on a certain level, you are actually taking. You end up with much more than what you gave. You give a donation, but you buy yourself a slice of eternity. How much is that worth? You give a donation, our Sages promise, 
that you will actually emerge from it richer. The Talmud tells us, Aser bishvil shetit asher. Give charity, tithe, give 10% in order that you become wealthy. So if I become wealthy, am I giving or am I taking? I'm taking. I'm ending up with more money. Says Moshe to Jewish people, take, take a donation. Why? Because you'll give a donation, but you'll end up with a lot more. What an idea. Now I saw the Ruach Chaim, the great comment on Perkei Avos from Abchaim Velazhener. He looks at the fifth Mishnah, Perkei Avos. Yihi beischa pasuach lervacha, let your door be open wide. But the word lervacha also means profit. So he says something fascinating. Let your door be open wide. Give lots of charity for your own profit. Take for yourself. And he quotes the Talmud. The Talmud says, Melach Mamon, the salt of money, chaser, is to give it away. How do you preserve your capital? How do you preserve your assets? How do you preserve your money? By giving it away, by giving it to charity. And then he says, that even though this seems counterintuitive, if I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm not getting. He says, nevertheless, in every single generation we see it, the ones who give the most, the ones who are very generous, they end up not losing, and they end up, in fact, gaining. And he quotes the verse. The verse says, listen to this. You'll like this. The verse says, you should plant for yourself tzedakah, plant for yourself charity. What does that mean? So he explains like this. If you look at a farmer, the farmer has some precious kernels. These kernels can be ground, turned into flour, turned into bread. But what does the, what does the farmer do? What does the planter do? He does something so silly. He takes those precious kernels that can be used for food for his family. And instead, he just throws them into the ground. What a fool. What's he doing? Why are you taking the precious food and throwing it, burying in the ground? But of course we know that it's going to redound to his benefit. He's going to place one kernel in the ground and starts and starts with tens, dozens, hundreds, scores of kernels are going to emerge from every kernel. And the verse tells us that charity is like planting those kernels. You put in a little bit, and it seems maybe to the uninitiated that you're losing, you're giving, but the truth is, vehicle truma, you are taking from me, Truma, because this will fill your storehouses. This will bring you wealth. And then he tells us that actually it's way better than planting. Because when you plant that one or two kernels, so ultimately you benefit, right? Because that one or two kernels results in a hundred kernels. So you end up better off because you took your one or two kernels and you multiplied it by a hundred X. But staka charity is even better because with charity, even what you give, you don't lose. When you take money and give it to charity, you are actually placing that as a deposit in real estate, in heaven, permanent real estate. That money is not lost. Yes, as they just tell us, you will actually benefit. You'll get more kernels in this world. Aser b'shul shetit asher, tithe, so you get wealthy. That's the benefits in this world. But even on the principle, you're not losing. It's not like you're, you'll lose the principle to gain those benefits. No, even the principle is going to be stored for you in heaven. And he quotes the amazing story in the Talmud book of Bava Basra, page 11a. The Talmud tells that there was a king named Munbaz, and there was a famine. And the king had lots of assets, lots of wealth, and he took all the wealth out of his storehouses, and he used it to feed the poor during the famine. And his whole family ganged up against him, and they said to him, what are you doing? You're taking the accrued wealth of our whole dynasty 
and you're using it to feed the poor, to do charity. What are you doing? This was stockpiled by generations, and now you are taking it and giving it away. So he responded. He says, you're right. This wealth was stockpiled by our antecedents, but I'm also stockpiling it. And I'm stockpiling it in a much better place. Our antecedents stockpiled it here below. I am stockpiling it above. Our antecedents stockpiled it in a place where people could take it, where it is vulnerable to theft. I'm going to stockpile it in the heavenly coffers where it cannot be touched. Our antecedents stockpiled in a place that it doesn't earn any dividends. I'm going to stockpile it in a place where it does earn dividends. Our antecedents stockpiled gold and silver. I am stockpiling souls. Our forefathers stockpiled for others. And I am stockpiling for myself. I'm taking. This is all going to accrue to my benefit for eternity. Our forefathers stockpiled it in this world. I am stockpiling it in Olam Abba. What an amazing idea. Our Parsha starts off and Moshe comes to the Jewish people. Give me your gold. Give me your silver. Give me all your precious wool. Give it to me. Gems, precious stones. Give it to me. But he doesn't say give it to me. He says take it. Why? Because with charity, with generosity, with benevolence, you don't lose. Not only don't you lose, you gain. Not only do you gain in the natural, the spiritual world, you actually gain here. You tithe and you become wealthy. As always, my email address is rabbiwalbajima.com. I hope you have an amazing day. I hope you have a fabulous rest of your week. I hope you have a sensational Rosh Chodesh. An incredible month of Adar upcoming. May you and your family be joyous every day of this month and every day of this year. And may you be blessed with an incredible, sensational, terrific, stupendous, spectacular Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with help of the Almighty, we'll talk again next week.